My name is Clancy Immerslund, and I'm an alcoholic. As who wouldn't be, I think. Before I say anything more stupid, I'd like to start off with something that happened to me a week and a half ago or so that you might get a kick out of. About all ten years ago, I was in school, and a boy and I, uh, I had come back from the Navy after the war and gone back to school, and he was fresh out of high school, but we were in the same grade, but quite an age difference. And he was one of these clean-cut all-American types that repel me on sight, and you, I'm sure. Uh, but he and I banded together and pooled our major resources, and we won the National Intercollegiate Championship in 1949, and uh, he and I made up the team. And even at that time, people were saying, why can't you be like Dick, good old Dick, clean-cut, all-American boy, you rotten, sodden bum? You know? <laughs> and my wife used to tell me about why couldn't I be like Dick, and my parents, and the president of the college, and my friends. And uh, in the ensuing years, things got worse. We pulled farther and farther apart. I kept sinking deeper into the mire. And each time I'd get in jail, I'd wonder, what where's old Dick tonight? <laughs> <laughs> old Dick kept rising, and I kept sinking. <laughs> Eventually, I committed to the nut house, and Dick was elected president of the Junior Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, by this time, I'd left with God from far behind me. I wanted to be as far away from this wretch as I could be. And I got thrown into jail in new and different states and cities and under new and varying conditions. And Dick, with perseverance and pluck, rose to the top. <laughs> Last year, I think we achieved our widest division. I'm sure everyone that I knew said, why can't, well, we know, why can't Clancy be like that person? <laughs> and, uh, so last year, I finally wound up in a new area in the Phoenix drunk tank, and I was, some guy was giving me the boots because I'd vomited on his bed. <laughs> and uh, old Dick was elected president of the state junior chamber of commerce. <laughs> I've been made an executive of the bank in my hometown. That's a typical success story that just makes your heart warm for America. <laughs> uh, so about two weeks ago, I got a letter from my mother, and it had a clipping in it. And I pulled it out, and I opened it, and there was the front page of my hometown paper. And whose picture was on the front page? Dick. And the headline was, Doosterbeck arrested in Los Angeles. Doosterbeck had embezzled from his bank. And so, Doosterbeck, I went down to see him, and I found out. He'd run away to Los Angeles. Neither one of us knew we were here. I was out here, and he was living down in Alvarado someplace. And uh, he was extradited back to Wisconsin and has been sentenced to do one to five in the state prison at Waupon now. <laughs> and I, and I, here I am, clean-cut, sober, and alert. <laughs> and I feel if there's any justice anywhere in this world, someone will write to him and say, Dick, why can't you be like <laughs> But I got quite a laugh out of that clipping, though I showed it to everyone that would stand still long enough to look at it. It did give me a laugh, but it did call back that perhaps my past years could have been a little better spent than they were. Last, late last summer, early last fall, I guess, I, I spoke here. I think it was the first talk I ever gave in Los Angeles of any length. And I remember coming in and... Uh, and thinking, well, I don't have much to say. I haven't been sober very long, but I can tell them what's happened to me. It was pretty flamboyant, the, the areas I'd operated in in my drinking. And I remember when I got done how good I felt that I'd gotten so much of that confessional phase out of my system. And tonight, I, as I was driving down here, I was thinking... Well, it, it's a little different situation now. Then I, I didn't even know if I could stay sober, but I, I remembered so much that had happened. Now I, I think maybe I can stay sober a little bit, maybe tomorrow. I, at least I'm sober today, and things are a little bit better. And perhaps I have progressed a little bit. I have uh, nothing exceptional in my life, I don't suppose, except that it happened in a 
in a shorter period of time than some others. It happened maybe in a 12-year period in which I achieved various heights and various depths that I wouldn't care to go through again. There was, uh, I can think with joy of the days that I was a brilliant young newspaper reporter with a great future. And then I they decided I wasn't very brilliant anymore, and so I no longer was. And I was I tried to become a brilliant young advertising man. I was successful for a while. And I was a brilliant young engraving production manager. And I was a brilliant young dishwasher. <laughs> and I was a brilliant young janitor. And I was a brilliant young piano player on Skid Row. And I was a brilliant young... Many, many occupations. And now I... Not only am no longer brilliant, but I fear I'm no longer young. <laughs> but the pains for me, I am sure, are no different in in effect than the pains were for each of you. I think we're all here because the pain became intolerable and we, we reached a certain limit which we could no longer cope with. We had to do something. The, the anesthetic was no longer doing the job. The anesthetic we counted on. As I, as I stand here and, and I was joking about Dick, and I mentioned the nut house, and I remember that very clearly. Two years and a half ago, I was committed to the Texas State Hospital for the insane for the rest of my life because I was hopeless. I'd been through every private means known to sober me up or to get me to act decently. Well, <laughs> and, uh, and it, nothing could do it. And I thought at that time, if, this is, if there ever was a bottom... This must be the bottom. But it wasn't the bottom because I still felt that Clancy could control his own life. He's learning from these experiences and can learn to control it. I remember with a great deal of pain the day that I was babysitting for my daughter and son at that time and I went down to get a beer and got back three days later and my son had died from pneumonia in my absence because the furnace had gone off in a cold Wisconsin day and daddy was drunk and they... No one knew about it. And I thought, this must be the bottom for anyone, I thought at that time. And it was. But I thought, well, it was an accident. I can, I can drink. It wasn't the drinking. It was something else. And I, I think of the time that, in a more humorous vein, that I lay on the second floor of a hospital with tubes in my arms and up my nose and being pumped out, as we all have been at one time or another, one way or another. And... On the fourth floor, my wife was also in the hospital giving birth to a baby. And I remember how badly I felt that the nurses would come to the door and scowl at me and talk to one another and point upstairs, and then that me and I used to lie there and writhe and cringe and think how, how bad these girls are. They should be sympathizing with me instead of they're sympathizing with my wife. Anybody has children, but I'm sick. And I, and I thought this should be a bottom. But it wasn't a bottom. There were no bottoms because I am cursed as many people are, I suppose, in varying degrees, with a complete self-indulgence. As long as there's anybody to listen to me and as long as there's anybody I can work on whose sympathy I can utilize for my own end, as long as I can go a little farther, I will go. I remember the time that on a drunk I killed my best friend. I thought, this was the bottom. What can I do? I could think, I thought maybe I could stop drinking. No, that, that didn't come to me. I thought I have to run away, as I have done so many times in my life. I ran away from the Midwest. I played the piano on Skid Row in San Francisco for four months until a friend found me and pulled me off. These things are not important in themselves, except that what is my bottom evidently is maybe worse than someone else's bottom and better than another person's bottom. Bottoms are strictly relative. It's how much I could forced on myself how stupid I was, how self-willed I was before something got through to me. And I don't know where the difference comes. I wish there was a line or a marker or a flag that would go up and say, you've now had enough, you're never going to drink again, this is it, but you don't know. This afternoon at the 6300 Club, I was sitting here after the meeting, and a fellow came up and he said, Clancy, he said, I, I hate to confess this to you, he said, but I'm just coming off a drunk. And I'd seen him several times. He, had, uh, he said, I've been to 90 straight meetings. 90 meetings in 90 days, every night. He said, and I was feeling so good, I felt that I couldn't be an alcoholic. So he's been drunk a week, and he lost his job, and he's starting over again. But for him, he had to find out again. I hope he doesn't have to find out anymore. I hope I don't have to find out anymore. 
whatever my difficulties are, I, I'm almost to the conclusion that drinking again will not help them. Uh, as the book says, and as the grapevine says this month, and as everybody says, no one ever came off a drink richer or healthier, healthier or in possession of more material benefits than they started. Uh, you may wind up with some things. I came back and wound up with a big lump on my noggin here. You can still see when I challenged the city of Juarez one evening to a... <laughs> and it only took one. and didn't take him very long. <laughs> that hurt my pride deeply. And you uh, wind up with some new some new charges being placed against you, uh, or you wind up with a new sense of remorse. You've added to the remorse that already was intolerable, and here you've added to it. So there's nothing you can do now except drink some more to forget it. So I, eventually, I think we all get to the point where the pain gets so intense, at least it did for me, that I could do nothing. And very strong graphic things, as I say, happened to me because I, I must have gone out of my way to make them happen. Everything had to be good, but they say we're perfectionists. I guess I wanted to be the biggest bum. But interspersed in between, I, I would have these moments. I'm still, I'm still good. I, I can't seem to handle my liquor sometimes, but I am good. And I put on a sustained rally, which I'm sure much, much of it's done. Uh, when I came out of the nut house, I finally got sprung because I had brought culture to the state of Texas. I started a newspaper in their nut house. <laughs> and, and early in my career there, they had, uh, I had broken out. And <laughs> being Texas is what it is, it's rather flat. And once you break out, they can see you running for about four days in any direction. <laughs> so it's no problem to get you back, but it was quite a retreat to break out. So they brought me back, and they, they gave me a special treatment they reserved for people like me. They, they massaged my head with electrodes, uh, shock treatments. They put me on the two a day, which is the maximum for wild people. And uh, they slowed me down considerably. Uh, I... Uh, I very well remember the day I woke up after coming off the shock therapy. They had me on, I don't know, 24 jolts or something. Uh, two a day for six days and then three a week for four weeks or something like that. I don't know. But anyway, what it happens to you, you lose your senses. You're gone. You have no conception of who you are or where you've been or what happened to you or what, why you're there. And then as you start to come out of it eventually after one of these sieges, you, uh, I remember sitting, I woke up and I looked around and I remember I was, I was just playing piano in San Francisco two years ago. I looked around, and there were bars on the windows. And I was, turned out I was in, I didn't know at the time, but I was in the violent end of the locked ward in a little room, and everybody in here was about in the same shape. And I thought, my goodness, who are these strange-looking people, you know? Mm. <laughs> and I, I wonder, now, who, uh, who are these folks? What am I here to... And I, uh, I couldn't make out who I was, didn't quite know my name exactly or why I was there certainly because all these two years had been wiped out in my memory and I thought that for a while that I died and gone to hell <laughs> I, I really did I thought I was in hell briefly until someone cursed me uh, one of the attendants cursed me and then I knew that they didn't even talk like that in hell I suppose <laughs> but I uh, I became a very model patient I didn't know why I was there for a long time but I knew I didn't want to stay there so I did everything they said and I started a newspaper, and I directed the Christmas can cantata of patience. That was a circus. Uh, <laughs> I, be, uh, I became the campus mailman, peddling mail. I had a pretty good deal. I let one of the preachers come out to convert me. Uh, I got out of there, in short. <laughs> and I, uh, I went back to El Paso, where, I, where my wife and daughters were living, and I thought, Certainly, I have learned a lesson from this, and so I went to AA that I've had skirmishes with off and on during the past five years. They used to come and visit me, and then I'd visit them, and then I'd be it. And I, uh, in 1953 or so, I'd written an article for the grapevine. I thought that was my contribution that time, and I got drunk. Uh, I had a not a very high opinion of AA, I mean, because of all this God crap, and I didn't believe in that nonsense. <laughs> And so I went to AA, and I uh, practiced the first and twelfth steps religiously. I announced that my life wasn't manageable, and I told other people all about it. That's, I carried the message. There's my AA. And I made, uh, oh, maybe four months after I got out, so I got to my birthday, my first birthday. I counted all the time. I was on shock treatments. I figured that's only fair. I hadn't drank. <laughs> so I, uh, on the day of my first birthday, I, I thought to myself, well... I'd given it a chance. 
doesn't make it. I'm not happy. My wife is still mean. My children are loud. My boss is cantankerous. I, uh, uh, a, a sensitive flower like me needs a little stimulation. So I stopped into Juarez and had a little vodka on the way to get my birthday cake, hoping that it would leave me breathless, as Mr. Smirnoff says. And so I never got to get my cake, and I guess it's still sitting there waiting. I must be old and tired by now. This is a couple of years ago. But I, uh, I had learned a lesson. I had learned how to drink sociably. I drank a few drinks, and I went home. And the next night, I drank a few drinks, and I went home. And this continued for weeks. I was so afraid of shop treatment that I something must have stopped me when I started taking <laughs> money. And I was about ready to write my article for Grapevine, How I Returned to Social Drinking, the first in history. And I got a very excellent job in Dallas. I went over there and worked on such great projects as the conversations between Elsie and Elmer, the board and cows, and uh, Hager slacks and what kind of slacks the people are wearing, and Fritos, the commercials for Fritos that you see on television that make you so thirsty that you get drunk and then the Fritos bring you out of it. Evidently, it's what the theory you worked on, I believe. Uh, and I socially drank, and I went to all the advertising parties, and I drank martinis, and uh, every once in a while I get into work, and I was there at Christmas time and got a lot of bottles, and it was fine. I brought my wife, and she came to Dallas, and... Uh, had another daughter. I had four daughters now, and I was uh, expansive and wealthy and a nice home and a car. But, of course, it's inevitable. My drinking was catching up, and pretty soon, bang, I was in the sanitarium. I got the job took me back. Bang, I was fired. Then I went to work at another job, equally good, because they thought I, I, I still had places to go and con people. And I said, now, give me one more chance, because I've seen my mistakes now. I, I think what's wrong is I've been drinking too many martinis. Uh, I'll just drink beer and I'll drink it at home. And I got a job as a manager of a very large plant in the uh, graphic arts field. And I did a very fine job and I went back from the sanitarium for a week this time. And finally my wife and children left me for the final time and I lost my job and everything came to an end. Every chance I'd had finally ended. And I thought, boy, I'm really being persecuted. This is too much. So I... Rented a car, my car was gone, my house was gone, my family was gone. And I rented a car and flipped off through Wichita Falls and wrote a newspaper for some critical campaign of just sat at a typewriter in a hotel room and drank and wrote a whole newspaper. Flipped off, drove across the state, careened, I should say, all the way across Texas in this rented car to El Paso. Got drunk, got thrown out of the bullfight, which is a very hard thing to do in <laughs> Alienated every friend I had in El Paso and careened off to see what was happening farther north in Oklahoma. And that day I finally wound up in the Phoenix tank, uh, alone, sick, broke, rotten, filthy. And I, since I couldn't drink, I had to face the reality that I was there and there was no place for me to go. I had just enough for within a dollar or so of paying my fine, so I got out. I remember very clearly standing in that hot summer's day in downtown Phoenix, sick, as I say in Rotten, unshaven, no place to go, and thought, what do in the world do I do now? Who, who can I contact that will help me out of this mess? And I had a dime. I didn't have enough to place any prepaid calls, but I called collect. I called to all my relatives in Wisconsin and in Minnesota, and I called all the places I'd worked for the last eight years or nine years. I called the college I'd attended. I called everyone in short that I could possibly think of that I knew. Incidentally, I called Dick, and he... <laughs> <laughs> but not a person of all that crowd would accept, even accept a phone call from me. They wouldn't accept a collect phone call. And I had no conception of my wife was, and she uh, instituting divorce. So there was nothing... I had no place to go. I, I had my choice right then, and, and I, this is true. You may have... We laugh at it now, but this is how we feel, at least how I felt at the time. I thought, now, how can I commit suicide? I can either commit suicide or I can... There's nothing else to do. And even suicide is not allotted to you at that time because to, for we people, I think, to commit suicide, we have to envision ourselves lying in the casket and there are many people passing by and saying, gee, I'm sorry I was so mean to those plants. <laughs> Otherwise, suicide is pointless. And... Uh, there wasn't anybody that would do that, I didn't think. So I thought, I can't even kill myself. Christ, I'm denied such small privileges as this. 
So I walked 12 or 14 blocks to Phoenix, dodging police and terribly alone, and walked to the Arid Club at Phoenix, and I walked in, and I sat there for three days and shook and shook and shook. It was very sick. And uh, I finally got through to an editor that I once knew in Texas on the guise of being a Phoenix correspondent calling in, so he accepted the charge. And he, I laid my story on him, and he wired me $20 on the basis that I would not use it to come back to Texas. <laughs> so therefore, Los Angeles held forth its arms to me. So I came here, and I went back to AA, and I, I thought, I'll, I have to give AA one more chance. I, it's funny now, and it's funny in retrospect, these things, but we all have been there in various ways ourselves. We know the terrible feeling of this is the end, and I think this was the end. I, I had never much more important bad things that happened to me, but nothing that left me so such a feeling of alone. There's nobody now except you that gives a damn whether you live or die. So if you don't care, you're done. And I, I thought, what is it? I knew the book. I think one of the greatest drawbacks of that a slipper has in coming back or a person who's played around with the program for length of time is that you know all the phrases. You know the book. I read the book twice, and I didn't even didn't pay any attention to it. I read the book. I knew the steps. I could recite them. I, when I came back to AA, I knew all these cliches. I knew all the trite phrases. I'd ridiculed all the spiritual bourgeois that people had been pushing out. And all of a sudden, I find myself in a position where I have to go back and start all over again and listen to the same thing and try to believe them things that I spent years ridiculing. I had to, I knew them, and but they didn't apply to me. Now I have to believe that they apply to me. And for any slipper, any person coming back, I think that that problem is there. There's no longer any golden, wonderful honeymoon period, at least not like <coughs> I've heard it described. There's no longer any magic in coming into an AA meeting. There's, no, there's not going to be a mantle of fire descending on you that's going to relieve all your pain forever and again as long as you live. You're going in there, you know, because this is the only damn place you can go to keep sober. And if you can't get it here, you might, you're you done because you've tried everything else. And so I threw myself into it. And I I didn't do a very good job. I, I was pretty sick mentally. I know that alcohol is our problem, but I'm sure that our squirreled up thinking compounds it grievously. And one of my fears had always been that I was going insane, and, and I, I thought I couldn't stay sober and remain sane because I had so many remorses, so many things that I'd done in my life, so many opportunities I'd lost, so many people I'd alienated and hurt. And I thought, how can I possibly stay sober? I, I, this pain is so intense, I have to anesthetize it. Uh, and it wasn't very easy at first. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't easy, I'm sure, for any of us at first. And I'm just saying this to confirm my own opinion. I'm like everybody else. It wasn't easy for me. And I was terribly sick. And I went to meetings. Every meeting I could find in the book. I went at night. And I went in the daytime. I went at night. And I was, I didn't have any money. I had weeks uh, of just, the first four months I was in Los Angeles, my clothes were locked up more than I had them. I mean, landlords were locking them up more than I was using them. Uh, so they still re retain some semblance <laughs> of use because I didn't use them much when I first came here. But I didn't much care, really, because my thought was, I have to get sober. What can I learn in this Alcoholics Anonymous program? And I thought, if one thing, if there's anything I must learn, I must learn something about this God nonsense. I had God pounded into me when I was a little boy. I was raised in a Lutheran family where God sat in the cloud and seemed to me as a little boy. He sat up there somewhere and he was a mean scowling old thinking. He waited for people to make mistakes, and since they made a mistake, <laughs> he'd, look, he'd look around, and it, I didn't want anything to do with people like that. I wouldn't drink with a guy, why I wouldn't stay with him sober, as the phrase goes. And so I had to find something that I could understand, and I, I thought higher power, and I talked to many friends, and they helped me a great deal in formulating an opinion. And it finally, now, as I this is very brief, and I won't bore you with it, but my God, to me, my higher power, is certainly not your higher power, and I'm sure you all have yours. I have mine. But this was how I found mine. I think this is the one significant thing I've found in AA that has helped me more than any other single thing, was this concept of a God. And I thought, now, how can I approach a God? I, I have no use for any God I've ever heard about. Where, where is God? And I, I, 
to get on this higher power business, I thought, well, what, what do I respect? What is the single factor in the world that I respect? I don't respect money. I know people's money that I hate. I, I don't respect, uh, I don't respect physical things. I respect, I guess, intelligence. I, I have a great deal of respect for people that I have an infinite amount of intelligence that can think. I, in a small degree, I have the respect for the, for the man who can lift the hood of my car. And I say, see, that's a big hunk of iron. And he says, no, that's your car. Baby. And he, uh, there goes the carburetor. There must be something that I can evolve for me that I can believe more, that will fit what I can understand. I, I'm, I don't understand very well. And eventually, through months of grasping and probing, it may change tomorrow. But I, I came up with something that's helped me a great deal recently. And the thought, for me, my personal God, my, uh, my personal, per, that I pray to is, is like, I, I think it was this intelligence or something maybe like a uh, television antenna. And the sending out a picture of good or a picture of what is right, of serenity, peace, understanding, whatever what you may call it, to everybody. No more to me than to you or no more to you than to me. But we're all getting it. And I feel if I'm not utilizing it, if I'm not getting any serenity or peace, I've been monking around with these dials on my set and there's something wrong with the receiver. There's nothing wrong with the antenna sending it out. And so if I am not, if I'm not careful, I get nothing. And if I work very hard and I, I keep doing the things that I'm told to do and that I can understand, then I, I'm in effect uh, working a little bit with the dials and maybe all the snow and fuzz will slow down after a while and there'll be a little line or there'll be a vague outline or a vague picture as we all have done that TV sets and keep playing around and hoping this is the knob, no, this is the knob, this is the knob. And so in every way I, I have to try to monkey with these sets myself. I have to try to become less uh, less intolerant. I must become less resentful. I must work on the resentful knob. I must work on all the knobs of my personal feelings that have made this picture completely un, un, uh, undecipherable to me. And I, I think that uh, if I am doing this, if I am working, I will get some serenity. If I do not, I can't say God is persecuting me. God is making it tough on me. God is forgotten me. He's not answering my prayers, but kind of a God to change gods again. This one isn't getting my messages. But I do think Clancy is sure screwing up again. Clancy better get on the stick. Clancy couldn't sleep last night. Clancy's doing something wrong. And this way I've been able to understand it. As I say, this means nothing. I'm sure that uh, your concept of God is much better than mine. But to me, I've been able to live with this. And I've been able to understand the 12 steps of this program in light of that as a God who does love me, but he doesn't love me better than anybody else, and he doesn't love me less than everybody else. He loves me, and he loves you, and he loves them, and if we wish to return this love, we'll be serene, or more serene and more happy. If we do not, then we're just monkeying with the dials and playing with the rabbit ears, and pretty soon it's all going to be all snow up there again, and we're going to be drunk. And I had a little trouble with humility. I... Uh, I feel that, I don't know about you folks, but to me, the one reason I could never achieve any humility was because I always felt so insecure and inadequate that I, I had to keep the front up constantly. I could never let down the front and even pretend to be humble because people might see how really humble I really was, what a rotten bum I was. I was arrogant, smart, I was smart and clever, ha ha ha, nothing ever gets through to me. Because if you keep the wall up thick enough, they'll never find out what a softy you are. Nobody can ever hurt you. You're never happy, but nobody can ever hurt you. And you go up through life and you think, ah, oh, I've got it made. Except the times when you wake up in the middle of the night and you think you're going insane. And the times you can't eat and you have to stay drunk to maintain the front. But outside that, it's a marvelous defense against the world. And I think in AA, one of the great concepts for me was the, was the idea that everybody here feels as inadequate as I do. Everyone here, in one way or another, feels that they, they're so, they have committed the things that I've committed. Not the same ones, but, but they feel they're as black as the ones I've committed. And everyone here is here for one reason. We're not here for Christ's sake to go to the Elks Club uh, to, to sell merchandise to the guy sitting next to us. We're here for one reason, to get our sanity back. And certainly everyone must be at the end because nobody comes in here after two beers and they don't like the beer so they come to AA. We're here to spend our life or as much as we care to spend, of trying every method of, of cheating and robbing and lying and using every method known 
to stay away from facing reality. And so, but still, humility to me was a tremendous hurdle. I, I, I don't understand humility. humility. When I said humility, I'm sorry, but all my life has conditioned me. For many months I thought humility was the, uh, the, the little humble, tugging on the forelock type that smiled everything and never answered back and never did anything. And I'd run kicks like that, four or five days of adopting humility. And at the end of about five days, I'd be so upset, I'd curse every one of them. <laughs> all my humility kicked with, and I, I varied constantly between this arrogance of insecurity and this trying to be humble, which didn't fool anybody, myself. And I thought, I'll never get this humility nonsense. I, I, I'm too stupid. I, I, I can't make it. And then I, for me, now this may not be for anyone else, but for me, I, it suddenly came to me that maybe humility, for me, I could think of as teachability. Because part of my front was all the time, you can't tell me anything, I know it, and I know it first, and I know it better. And the idea that maybe somebody else could teach me something. Maybe I could listen to someone else. Maybe I could sit night after night after night in the AA meeting, not just to come in out of the cold, but to listen and try to apply what, I've been, what I'm hearing, try to apply to my own life and my problems. And somehow or other, by using teachability for humility, I, I found a little piece that probably is not the correct way to work it, and I wouldn't suggest it to anyone else, certainly. But for me, this is what I found these past months, that I can maybe a little bit be taught. Maybe I can be taught more next week, and maybe I hope much more next year, but at least I've been able to listen a little bit. I've been able to get enough security so I can take down the front enough so I can let people know that I'm listening. And that is, a, to me, a, a marvelous thing because it, the pressure's off. You don't have to impress so many people anymore. You don't have to keep conning. You can kind of sit back and say, well, if you don't like me, you don't know what you're missing because I'm all right. It's a marvelous feeling. But I've had some good things in AA. I mean, no material things, especially. I During the time I've been here, I've been one of the outstanding janitors on South La Brea. We're perfectionists, and I try to get the cleanest windows in our shopping center. I have washed dishes up on the Sunset Strip, and I'll never clear another dishwasher again, because I couldn't even cut it. These guys were waiting for me, and I was slow, and I thought, this is pretty sad. Here I've spent all my life making fun of dishwashers, and I can't even do it. But it was a good experience, because... I was doing something on my own that, no, I wasn't conning anybody, I wasn't cheating anybody, I was I working my fingers to the bone for a 12 and 13 hour shift at night. It, I felt good in the morning, I felt awfully tired and I felt cross, but I felt, well, at least I made these bucks honestly, I didn't con anybody out of them. And I have done various things. Now next week, I, if things go well, or maybe not, if things go well, I'll be writing again, maybe for NBC television. If things don't work out that way, I hope that they're going to work out, I may be back washing dishes on sunset. But it really doesn't make any difference because I can sleep at night. And there's a difference. That's what sobriety brings. Sobriety doesn't guarantee me, if you've heard, any job, any anything. It gives me the ability to cope with the problems I've got within me. I'm sober enough now, if I can cope with the problems, I can go to as far as I can get these knobs going. And if I can't cope with the problems, then at least I'll be clean and I'll be off the streets and I won't be bothering people. But if the guy that is given to me is what only a chance to utilize what I've got. If I haven't got anything, I can't utilize it, but I'm at least I'm sober. So AA, to me, has given me one other thing that I thought I'd lost. I guess the last time I cried was about when I was nine years old. Some My dad beat the hell out of me for something, and I, uh, I cried beautifully. I thought, nobody will ever make me cry. And I didn't. I... Uh, I had tears in my eyes sometimes, but I didn't cry because, by God, nobody ever see that I was soft again. I would keep that front so tight they'd never see me soft. Last Christmas Eve, this last Christmas Eve, I was feeling a little sorry for myself. I was <laughs> about seven o'clock at night, and everyone else was going home and wrapping presents and living it up, and I was sweeping out the store down there. <laughs> the janitor was finishing up, and I thought, gracious, this is kind of a futile what sense of keeping sober? Everybody else has got something. I got, I got this broom for my Christmas Eve present. I don't like this. And the phone rang, and, and my four daughters called me up, and they were on the telephone from Dallas. And each of them spoke to me in turn. They said, Daddy, we're just going to bed now, and we, we called you to tell you that we love you very much, and we're glad that you're getting better. And we have to go now, and we talked a minute more, and they hung up. And as I say, I probably won't see them for a long time, but I... I uh, 
I went into the washroom there, and I didn't let anybody know about it, but I locked the door, and I sat down, and I cried and cried and cried. And I think that was the nicest Christmas Eve I've ever spent in my life. I felt much closer to my children than I did last year when I was in the room with them, because last year I was drunk. And each year before that, there's always some next Christmas going to be better. But this Christmas I was closer, although separated by thousands of miles. I thought, if AA gives me nothing else, this has given me something that my daughters like me and call me, and that they also have all my, have inherited something from me. They, they call collect. <laughs> I know that I transmitted several things to my daughter, so thanks to them, the ability to call collect. But that was a wonderful Christmas, and from a sad Christmas to your life, and all day Christmas, smiling among my AA friends, spreading sunshine. This was the nicest Christmas. And that, I write to my daughter each week now, and she writes back, and we have a, my oldest daughter, she's about 10. She writes very well, and she's smarter than I am already, and she condescendingly passes long bits of information that I utilize. And I write with my questions, and she sends me answers. She's kind of my Dallas, Norman, Vincent Peale. <laughs> but uh, we get along well, and I, they tell me about their trials and tribulations. And I, I feel this is, for the first time in my life, I'm a father. And I don't see them. I don't uh, talk to them or anything. And I, as I say, I probably want them to grow up. I keep saying that so I can get used to the idea. But I, I feel that for the first time in their lives, I'm their father. Whether I'm married to their mother or not anymore, I am their father, and I love the idea very much. And then uh, sitting there listening to Mary's night and her marvelous talk and her most sincere talk, and I was thinking of all the things that I've read and felt on AA and, and the various things that I've tried to teach myself. I've done a very poor job in coming back compared to what I'd like to, but I, at least I'm not drunk tonight. And I'm feeling a little bit better. And I noticed this book up there, 12 Steps and 12 Traditions. I asked Marilyn to bring it over to me because it's something I read in here a few months ago that really jumped out and grabbed me, every line of it. And it, if I could think of one prayer that I could say to God as I understand him that could help me to convince myself that I must look for if I'm going to find sobriety. I remember reading in here, and it really is very fine. I, it's very short. I just, maybe you read it, but it's wonderful. Lord, make me a channel of thy peace that where there is hatred, I may bring love, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, that where there is error, I may bring truth, that where there is doubt, I may bring faith, that where there is despair, I may bring hope, that where there are shadows, I may bring light, that where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord. Grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand rather than to be understood, to love rather than to be loved. For it is by self-forgetting that one finds. It is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Thank you.